Welcome folks to the ESER FY22 Performance Report Office Hour. As you folks know, we were supposed to hold this on Tuesday, but Mother Nature had a different plan. Um, so we're glad that you were able to join us today and we apologize for needing to reschedule. However, we will record this office hour to be sure that we can post it on our website after the fact. Sorry, there we go. So a concept that we wanted to introduce today to think about how we can digest some of the material that we will share with you folks is through this traffic light concept. So we're going to have different sections of the performance report that we stop and pause and ask you folks as participants, how are you feeling? Are you a red, a yellow, or a green light? And essentially red is, my goodness gracious, I likely have a fair amount of questions to ask, and I may also need other support. So the yellow light is the next step, and it's related to there may be questions after you engage in the task, but at this time, you may not find it as urgent as a red light task. And we will also identify, you folks will self-identify these tasks mm -hmm. with your understanding and your context, what might be a green dot task, which means it's easy, it's not an urgent task because you know that if you have five minutes, you can go directly to this file and pull the information that you need and you're not relying on others and you may not um, need any additional support from us as a team or your colleagues at the local level. So we just wanted to highlight a couple of the statutory requirements that are related to performance reports. So there's a state performance report requirement and also a subgrantee performance report requirement. And as we go through this next hour, we'll talk about both of those components. But here on the slide that Karen just showed, number four, highlighted sort of the purposes of the performance report. So what the performance report does allows you to capture information in that moment of time for that performance period. And the performance period that we're talking about in regards to FY22's ESER performance report is July 1st, 2021 through June 30th of 2022. And that will be in a slide in just a moment, but I wanted to highlight that here. Um, so one of the things that you want to think about is what activities may have transpired in that time and have I also requested reimbursement. So here on this slide, we talk about the ESEA, which is the State Education Agency Collection Form, which is the state requirement stat from statutory of what the DOE needs to report to the US Department of Ed. The collection of that information is publicly available. So we have a link here to that publicly available document that they have shared with us at the end of February. And we also wanted to call your attention to it. In the slides coming, you will note that we say see page 46 in this document, and this document is the collection form. Again, highlighted here in red is the re performance report that we are asking of you folks is the time frame of July 1st, 2021 through June 30th of 2022, which is FY22, if anybody um, wants to sort of make that denotion between the state fiscal year and the calendar year. As you folks likely know, um, the FY22 ESER performance report is due April 7th of this uh, year, so 2023, and is now available on the GEMS website. When we released the priority notice about a week and a half ago, GEMS was still in the process of being developed. However, we wanted to be sure that you folks had the information to start collecting the content for the performance report, which is why we released the template last week. But now we are now available and uh, 
it is now available on GEMS. So go ahead and take a look um, on the GEMS website and we'll talk about exactly where to find that in just a moment. We completely acknowledge that there is an extremely tight timeline for when we as a department became aware of the requirements for the report and the specific information that was being requested of the SEA and where we are requesting information for you folks. So knowing about that tight timeline, we have created some resources that hopefully will assist you folks in being able to accomplish this task before April 7th of 2023. So again, I highlighted it just a moment ago. We released a template, which we're referring to as the blank copy, both in a PDF form and a Word form. So you have access to the questions that are in GEMS ahead of time. We have also created standing Wednesday open no agenda sessions. So we had our first one yesterday, Wednesday, uh, the 15th at 11 a.m. And we will host those one hour open sessions through April 5th. Every Wednesday from 11 to 12, you can jump in anytime. You do not need to make an appointment. You can jump in anytime within that one hour block. And there will be at least one of the members of our team there to engage in question and answers. So at that time, if you happen to have a, a question in regards to one particular aspect of the performance report, we can jump into our test site, we can walk through it, we can take a look. So that time is really important should you have any additional questions related to the performance report. As I mentioned, we're recording this web, this office hour and we will post it, but we are also working on developing a frequently asked questions. And I love that there's, there's messages already popping into the chat box, which is wonderful because we have a fair amount of content for you today just to walk through the different sections of the performance report that we will hold all questions till the end, but we may get to a point where we've run out of time because there's our hour this uh, today is very rich in content that we encourage you to put your questions in the chat box because we can always incorporate those questions from the chat box into our FAQ. One other component that we um, did to help with the tight timeline is we pulled as a team all of the fiscal data from the main fiscal um, fiscal, fiscal grant reimbursement systems and clearly articulated that in the performance report. And that's essentially what we're going to jump right into. Yeah. So as we said, we populated some fiscal data for you folks within each of your individual performance reports. It's very specific to your district. It's very specific to the reporting performance period and it's very specific to each ESER funding. So here's a CARES example, but you should see this throughout your performance report. And we are aware that the date in GEMS currently is mis reflecting the reporting period. We are working on catching those errors that were overlooked in our quick, quick test review on Monday. Um, and we will go back and resolve those errors. So when we're thinking about the time frame of July 1st, 2021 through June 30th of 2022, this example, they requested reimbursement for $75,000 291 and 77 cents. So what we did was we went back to the system in which we use as a department to request funding on the district's behalf from the US Department of Ed. So we do not keep cash on hand. We, every time a reimbursement request comes in, we have to make that connection to the US Department of Ed and illustrate what the expense was for that it's gone through a review process and it's an allowable expense. And we draw down money from the US Department of Ed 
to be able to process a check to the school district. So one of the things that we kind of want to highlight is when you're working within the federal grant reimbursement system within GEMS, you want to be mindful of the billing date versus the billing period. And I will give very clear definitions of those two billing date and billing period in just a moment. But as you can see, the billing date is the date in which you will be looking at to align it to the performance, the period of performance. So we highlighted a fair amount of dates on the left-hand side in the yellow box, denoted the fact that 7-4-2022 is outside of the period of performance, so that dollar value of $18,000 that was requested may have been for activities that transpired within the performance period. However, the Department of Ed, as well as the US Department of Ed was not aware of those activities and that expense until the start of 7-4-2022. So no money was requested on the district's behalf from the US Department of Ed till after the period of performance that we're talking about for this ESER report. So again, I, I indicated that we would define those terms, billing date versus billing period. So the billing date is the date in which it initiated main DOE's understanding of the expenses, as well as the US Department of Ed's understanding of the activities that transpired. The billing period is the reflection of when the activities truly transpired. So we are not aware of these activities and the expenses until the billing date, which is the key when you're looking at this performance report, because the billing date is the date that was used to illustrate the spending per ESER funding, as well as per district. So you might be thinking to yourself, well, goodness gracious, that is very different than last year's performance report. And yes, it is very different than last year's performance report. And last year's performance report was already utilized to communicate clearly to the US Department of Ed. However, in that communication to the US Department of Ed, the US Department of Ed came back and said, well, this amount and the amount we have in regards to this district does not align. So we had to work with the US Department of Ed, review all of the drawdowns that we did in FY21 and allocate those funds to each district who drew down in that fiscal year. And then we were able to clearly articulate to the US Department of Ed that the documentation we had and the documentation they had matched dollar for dollar, penny for penny. So when you're looking at this second pre-populated area, which is under the planned uses in the performance report, you're looking at the allocation, the prior reporting expenditures. So anything before June 30th of 2021. Again, very clearly, I'm going to articulate that that date is the billing date when the expense was originated for reimbursement, not when the activity may have transpired at the local level. The current reporting period, which we are actually changing the terms there and going to call it the FY22 reporting expenditures, is the dollar value that you saw earlier in each of the ESER funding sources. And then the remaining funds is as of July 1st, 2022, what was in CARES, CARESA, and ARP. One thing, and you'll notice these stars throughout the PowerPoint, as well as a tiny little note when there's a star denotion, that we are aware that there is a calculation error for that remaining funds. However, the amounts in regards to the prior reporting expenditures and the current reporting expenditures are indeed accurate. And we've verified those and have spot checked about 32 districts. Oh, 
Uh, hi, this is Karen. Um, just a reminder and, and clarification that the performance report you're getting and that we're talking about is for ESSER 1, ESSER 2, and ESSER 3, or CARES, CARISA, and ARP. And we are not asking at this time about the CRF funding, which was from a different funding source, as you remember, the U.S. Treasury, nor are we asking about the Homeless Children and Youth, or HCY, funding. Furthermore, uh, we're reminding everyone that the 12 month tidings period, which is a aspect of uh, the GEPA provisions has already been allowed, has already been added on to these funds for all three of the funding packages. And the periods of allowability for the three separate funding packages are summarized below in that chart. And you'll notice that we've struck in a line through CARES ESER 1, because uh, funds needed to have been invoiced by last December. So to review uh, SR2, uh, the funding is allowable through September 30th and will need to be invoiced before December 30th, 2023, hopefully well before. And ARP SR3, uh, same calendar days, but uh, another year, September 30th, 2024, and invoiced by December 30th, 2024. And we do not foresee any extensions beyond that time. Um, so a little practical information, where will you find the place in GEM to submit the report? Uh, once you log into GEM, you're going to be seeing on the left-hand side that landing page. That's the same landing page that I see. And you're going to look for uh, ESSER performance report. And then it is PR phase two is this year three or FY22 performance report. And you'll use the uh, same username and password to log in. Let's see, um, we're summarizing for you again, this is just logistical information about what the report's going to look like and uh, trying to force uh, uh, not have any difficulties submitting the report. All of the check marks for all of those areas from general directions and essential information through uh, part, I think we're supposed to say part nine there, uh, Davis-Bacon requirements need to be checked off. So there are 10 parts to the performance report. You have to look at each page and submit something on every page and you need to have those check marks next to the data entry on that page before it can be submitted. Um, all work needs to be conducted on the data entry a check mark before a link indicates that all the required information has been entered on that page. And then you'll, able, you'll be able to submit the report. Uh, this is an important piece of information because we know that uh, new, new superintendents are hired uh, and uh, new, new, new names uh, need to appear on the report. In order for your superintendent to receive notification that this report needs to be verified by them, um, we need to make sure you need to make sure whoever's working in this uh, system needs to make sure that the name of the superintendent and the contact information is clearly there, as well as whoever the ELA contact person is. And you can see those uh, encircled in sort of a yellowish uh, box down at the bottom. Uh, notice too, do you see the blue arrow? UEI number. Um, the federal government is requesting us to submit UEI numbers for districts uh, much more often than DUNS numbers. We had been using DUNS numbers. So we're gonna be asking you, even though that DUNS number notification is there, you see Shelley's uh, blue star, <laughs> it means it's gonna be something that will be edited out and it will be the uh, UEI number that you will submit there. And this you'll find on the performance report setup pages. Setup page. Uh, let me make sure I've copied or have everything over on the other side. Okay, when, once the performance report is ready for submission, the uh, GEM system will generate an email to the superintendent. You know, again, underscoring why it's important to have the correct name and contact information of the superintendent there, uh, indicating that their review is needed. And in this e email, there will be a URL, username, and password to certify the performance report. So there's a, there's a check on the report. 
Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, go back, go back to 14, I think. Oh, sorry. Okay. So again, we're just going to go quickly through some of the sections of the performance report. And the next one is um, there are directions and then different pieces of, of how to do this part of the, um, the performance report. Unlike last year, um, there's a little bit more uh, requirement now to identify how all of the expenditures, how did they fit into the specific categories that are listed here on the right side of the slide. So in this part of the application or part of the, uh, the performance report, we're gonna ask you to really define how those are to assign the category of where those expenditures were. And as you can see, it's addressing physical health and safety, meeting students' academic social needs, mental health supports, operational continuity. We do wanna highlight the mental health supports for students and staff. That is different. The US Department of Education has a clear definition of what, so if you put, if you put an expense was for mental health supports for students and staff, it does need to meet this definition. And you will need to keep documentation that shows why you put this in there. So the purpose of this reporting, social and emotional support is conducted by a non-licensed practitioner or professionals and mental health services are conducted by licensed practitioners or professionals, including psychologists and psychotherapists. And again, within each uh, expenditure category, the expense needs to be ca classified to an object category, which is a little bit different than was last year, but that's because this is what the US Department of Education is wanting for these funds. And this is just um, kind of a, a, a what's coming up next year. And we want you guys to be very aware of it so that you can start planning for it now. So we know the US Department of Education has made it very clear that in the FY23 reporting period or performance report, that SAUs are going to need to provide the amount of SAU expenditures by ESSER subgrant fund and activity. So you're going to have to literally list in there how much money you have spent for each of the, uh, the different categories. And then you're going to have to do it by each of the, the grants. Now you're probably wondering why ESSER one would be in FY23. Well, F ESSER 1 will be in FY23 because you have that period between July 1st and of September 30th of 2022, uh, which will be counted in the FY23 performance report. So you want the, the CARES ESSER 1 will still be there. Um, and we wanted to, we have kind of a preview, a preview question, and that is. You want to pro provide the amount of the LEA expenditures by ESSER subgrant sub and activity for the reporting period. So this is, if you want more information about this, um, when Shelly did her present or talked about at the beginning of the slide, we put in there the public um, reporting document or the reporting document that we, the, um, the Department of Ed Main Department of Education has to report back to the U.S. Department of Education. And um, it it is actually this requirement or this notification is on page 46 of that document. So if you wanna go back and read about it, you can, uh, but we just wanna give you a heads up so you're not shocked and you can start planning for now what's gonna be asked for next year. And then part two, expended, um, expenditures and uses. Um, again, a little bit more detail than what was required last year. Uh, for each of the areas that you selected, or each of the priority areas, or like the, um, it's kind of tiny on my screen, but like for addressing physical health and safety, you're going to have to list for each of the funding sources, CARES, CRISA, and ARP, how much money within those, um, within those categories, how much did you spend on the object codes, or what we call object codes, how much did you spend on supplies, how much did you spend on um, on benefits, how much would you spend on salary? So this is going to be a requirement for CARES, uh, CRISA, and ARP. There is, and I don't know if it's on this particular slide, but I do have a note to make sure we mention it, um, that in ARP, you're going to have to, you're going to have to explicitly show how much you spent on the 20% evidence-based reservation and also on the remaining funds. And and um, together that should be the amount you spent total. Now we do know um, through some feedback from, um, from some of your colleagues, they've let us know that some of the calculations aren't working right for ARP, but we're currently working with our GEMS programmer to get that um, corrected. 
Um, and I think, and you're only going to report your expenditure once in the table, um, especially with ARP. So you're not going to double up on your ARP. Um, and you're going to use the most appropriate and specific expenditure category, category for each ex, for each expenditure. We do kind of have a question here, something to think about. That's the stoplight, and that is, please note that where the expenditures are self-reported. So how you're going to what category you're going to put them in, that is up to the SAU. Uh, we do encourage you to think about um, future reporting, and if you put it in a certain category for this year to make sure about if you're gonna report it again next year, if you have a continuation expense. Um, so we want you to think about what color would you select for the task of reporting expenses um, by activity for all ESSERs? Um, and if you wanna just put it in the chat, is it red? Is it something you're gonna to have to really think hard and spend quite a bit of time on? Or is it kind of in between, or are you all set, you're green and you know exactly where all of your expenditures for all three funding um, sources uh, and what, how are you going to go? Honestly, we think a lot of time is going to be spent on this part, but we could we could be completely um, wrong on that. And that's why I want to get your um, a little bit of your feedback on that. I was going to say, if there's any brave souls out there and don't mind sharing it, where their traffic light would be for this question in the chat box, that would be great for our team to see as well. And, and, and I think I, what I, I, sorry, money. I'm sorry, and I forgot, I, I, um, I need to make my screen bigger. Um, I did want to point out one more thing about the slide and um, is that if you see kind of at toward on the left hand side up toward the top, we actually, uh, we actually um, highlighted the amount of funds that um, we, that the, um, the Department of Education has, uh, that this is the amount that's been drawn down from the U.S. Department of Education. So that top amount at the that 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 amount at the top should equal your amount down at the bottom. So if you see the two like rectangles, um, it says um, like forty eight thousand. That should equal what your bottom total is at the amount. And that's what I was referring to with ARP. We know some of the the calculations are off, but they should equal. So that that amount at the top should equal the amount at the bottom when you're finished. And did we get some red, green, or yellow lights? Yes. I, I'm not looking. Are they red? They're all over. They're all yellow, oh, green, okay. everything in between. Right. <laughs> okay. And again, um, part two is this is where the ARP comes in. I kind of jumped ahead a little bit, but this is the ARP uh, section is going to look a little different. You're still going to report on your expenditures by category and also by, I called it object code. But with ARP, like I said, you're going to have two columns. You're going to have one where you're going to report on your 20% uh, reservation. And then the other column is going to be your remaining funds. And together, those two columns should be your total, should be your total. And then at the end, um, that amount at the end uh, should equal the amount at the top. Now, again, there's a little blue star there because we know currently the calculations are not, uh, they're not calculating correctly. And we're working with our JUMPS programmer to make sure that those, um, those calculations come out uh, correctly. Uh, that, like I said, the total amount expenditure by category, some of the two columns must total the amount paid during the performance report period, according to the means financial system records. Okay, so just a, a little pause to think about the expenditure categories. Um, you know, there are the four, the addressing physical health and safety and so forth. Shelley has already highlighted the difference, or Monique did perhaps, between uh, social, emotional, and other needs and the mental health supports. And to review, the definition is right there in number three. Uh, we know, we anticipate that some of these uh, may be judgment calls that you will make on your part. Um, so these are going to be self-selected. You get to select where uh, an expenditure makes the best sense. Um, for example, additional information technology salary or, or the salary to support one-to-one -one learning. Um, you know, I might think that that's going into category uh, two, meeting students' academic, social, and emotional needs. Others of you, you may say, no, at the time, we were we really needed that person for operational continuity. So some of these are going to be very clearly sorted into one of those four categories. Others of them are going to be a toss-up. 
Is there someone who wants to come off mute and say where you would put the minivan purchase to support transportation to a special purpose private school? I would put it to addressing physical health and safety. Ah, okay, okay, and, and why? Because that's a vehicle meant to get a child to somewhere safe. Yeah. They're in oh. ten, tended location. Yeah. Sure, sure. I, I mean, that absolutely makes sense. I think this morning when we did a practice run through this on our team, I said, well, that's for operational continuity because, you know, the program wouldn't continue without the youngsters being uh, transported to the school. But you can see where there are different rationales, but we just wanted to bring that, uh, bring this part to your attention. Okay, and uh, so moving on in the uh, pr actual performance report, as you're going to be seeing it in GEM, parts three, four, and five require a yes, no response uh, and do, do check a box. Don't leave any of these, or they're not boxes, they're circles. Don't leave any of these dials unchecked. Um, and so they're asking about whether or not the SAU expended ESSER funds on items related to safe in-person instruction. This is gonna be looking familiar to those of you who filled this out last year uh, to provide home internet access uh, to re-engage students with uh, poor attendance. Um, and if you select other, uh, a little pop-up box should appear and you need to specify other. And I th think, if you're not checking yes for other, you do need to check no for other. I think that's what we determined. Um, and so we'll just ask you, uh, if yes is selected under other, you need to supply, that, that note is there. But we're gonna ask you, is this an e relatively easier, a green light task, or is this gonna be a red light task? Someone could put it in the chat and we'll, we'll find it later and just kind of keep that in mind, the extent to which it's going to be um, a challenge for you to, to find this information. Oops. Slide 19, which is where we were, correct? Slide 20. Did the SAU allocate some portion of the ESSER funds to schools in this reporting period? Oh yeah, so this is new this year. And this, uh, the federal government is asking whether or not um, the funds went somewhat equitably or equally to schools in the district. And if they weren't, uh, what decisions did you, what documentation can you provide to show that you made the best decision by putting more funds in one area or one school than another? So how did this LEA allocate ESSER funds? Mark yes or no to indicate whether the criteria uh, were used to allocate ESSER funds to schools. For example, if the LEA allocated funds using a weighted formula, of total number of enrolled students uh, and total number of uh, enrolled students with disabilities, the SAA should the SEA should mark yes in rows A through B. So you're going to get some questions about how you know some pre-determined um, selections that you will use to uh, respond to how you select how you decided to disperse these funds out to the schools. So again, this is another one where we're wondering, this is a new question this year. So, you know, to what extent might you think this is a challenging question, you know, a red question where you're gonna have to contact someone else and ask, okay, how, how did we determine this after all? Uh, or a green light, oh, it, that, that's pretty well documented. It's in our, um, our stakeholder notes for uh, stakeholder consultation that we had uh, early on when these funds were dispersed or allocated. Okay, so this part is about school resources and it contains a pre-populated amount for the reservation project and a response for the total expenditures for the reservation project that was reimbursed in FY22 
a response about which activities and interventions were supported by ARP SR3, and a response to have the activities or interventions that were selected. Um, in my notes, and this is slide number 21, this is actually one that Monique will speak to. I've just read through the bullets for you, but she can fill in the details. So as Karen already stated, um, for the ARP um, section of this, there is the learning reservation or the 20% reservation for interrupted instruction or learning loss that was caused by COVID. So you will you will have to indicate, I'm going to kind of break this up in pieces. There's three kind of parts here, and I'm going to start with the middle one first. You're going to have to talk about um, how, how you used these um, reservation funds, and you're going to actually have to check which ones that you used. And you can't say, you have to have a yes or a no. You can't leave it blank. So um, you have to choose, yes, we used it for it, or no, we did not. If you do choose, if, they, if you can't find a category in here that you actually used um, your 20% funds for, then you need to, um, you can select other, and then you will have, if you put select other, then you will have to fill in what you used that for. Now, remember, this is actually um, what was drawn down during from the U.S. Department of Education during the uh, during this reporting period, not what is budgeted, not what you have written in your application, but what you've actually um, what was actually drawn down based on um, the main uh, the, the main fiscal reporting period or main. So there's so many different pieces here. Um, and so you. This might be a little more confusing. So, for example, we have some districts that have not invoiced yet or received reimbursement for any of their 20% reservation. So, technically, they would probably say no because they have not spent, they have not received re any reimbursement for that uh, during that um, reporting period. Now, the, the first one, number one, this is the total expenditures of ARP reservation funds. Um, this is going to be pre-populated for you so that you won't, um, it may say zero, it may say an amount. Um, this is the amount that you're going to have to verify. Then um, on the last part, you're going to have to also describe. So if you put yes, if you select yes for any of these categories or activities that you used your 20% reservation funds for, you're going to have to describe in there how effective that programming was. And this is, I can guarantee, this is something that the U.S. Department of Education is wanting. They want to know how, they want it, They want an assessment of how effective these intervention um, or these 20% reservation uh, projects were, how effective were they. And you will need to comment on that. So that's a narrative part that you will go in there and write how um, the impact uh, or the effectiveness of those um, interventions or activities that you selected in the middle part of this. Now, um, we do have a kind of a question here. What color would you select the documentation? What, what color would you select for the documentation needed to support the response to this question? So um, remember, we talk a lot about documentation. I get a lot of questions from districts. Can I do this? Can I do this? And I say, yes, it could be allowable, but you want to make sure you have the documentation that supports whatever you want to spend these money on, this money on. So in, in particular for the 20% reservation, if you put this in and you're saying that it is addressing learning loss and you're putting it in there to address learning loss, then you need to have the documentation that, on, that, on, that not only shows that it was used to um, support uh, learning loss that, was, that occurred because of the pandemic, but you also want to have documentation uh, showing the effectiveness of it or, um, or at least um, evaluating the effectiveness of the impact of this intervention. And if you go back to the application, we asked a question in there about how are you going to measure the impact of this intervention on, um, on how it addressed the learning loss that was caused by the pandemic. So we, we really are putting a big focus on documentation. And as, a, as you can see, um, you will have to ask, you will have to answer a question about how impactful or how, uh, like uh, analyze the effect or the impact of that, of the interventions that were implemented using the 20% reservation funds.
And this again is kind of um, a precursor or kind of a what's coming up for next year for FY23. We wanted to throw this out here so that you guys can start planning for it now um, and you won't be um, scrambling next year. But we know that, and this is coming directly from that publicly available document that Shelly talked about, that this is directly from the reporting sheet that we're going to have to report back out to the U.S. Department of Education next year, and that SEUs must provide expenditure detail, the amount expended by activity, rather than just marking yes and no. So on the previous slide, you just had to write a yes or a no, or click a yes or a no if you used your 20% reservation monies for those particular activities. We know next year in FY23, you're going to have to uh, you're going to have to actually put in there like how many students were impacted by this, how many students participated in that particular activity, what student groups participated in that activity. Um, the question is like, how did this LEA use ESSER funds to support learning recovery or acceleration for student groups? It's not just going to be ESSER 3, it's going to be ESSER 1, and it's going to be ESSER 2 funds as well. Um, again, ESSER 1, because you have that period between July 1st of 2022, until um, December, um, I'm sorry, November, sorry, September 30th of 2022. So you're going to have that that three month period there that you're going to have to report out on. Um, it's supporting recovery, acceleration for student groups who were disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. So these are things that we want you to start thinking about now um, so you're not scrambling next year. Uh, and I think that was, I'm just reading my notes here real quickly. Um, Right, so if you haven't been keeping track of like numbers or the number of students that have been participating, hopefully you have, but you wanna keep want to keep doing that and you wanna put that in a place that you'll be able to access that um, next year because you'll be reporting on what's happening now for the FY23, um, when this comes out next year for the FY23 performance report. And, um, so also this was reported last year. You did have to report on your FTEs, but this year the US Department of Education wants it a little differently. So it does look a little different. You still have to report on your FTEs um, and it is total FTEs for, for, the whole, for your whole district. It's not how you paid for them, were they federally funded, were they locally funded? This is all just straight out FTEs. And they want to see trends, as you can see from the highlighted box there. They want to see what the enrollment was in 2018. What, sorry, not enrollment, what your FTE was, what your FTEs were in 2018, what they were in 19, 20, 21, all the way to 22. And again, that is straight out FTEs. We gave a little example here of what could be considered to be an FTE. It's your full time equivalent, um, is the amount of time uh, per week spent on an activity divided by the amount of time per week normally considered as a full time. Um, we want you to, to, the FTE should be expressed as a decimal to the nearest tenth. So if you have 4.23 you know, teachers, um, then do that. Um, I'm sorry, 4.2 teachers. And then again, regardless of how the FTE is funded, because we get a lot of questions like, is it everybody? Yes, it is all of your FTEs, regardless of how they are funded, you're going to list that for the five years, eight, 2018, 2019, 2020, 2021, and 2022. Um, again, we our question uh, for you to think about is if you're thinking of the stoplight and you're thinking about documentation of how um, we show this FTE information, um, what documentation is needed to support um, what we what you put into these um, for these years for the FTE. And the reason why we also focus on FTEs is because this is kind of an aside. We are working with school districts to on the MO equity for the FY22 MO equity. And there were a lot of uh, districts that were struggling with getting FTE counts. So you really wanna make sure that you have a good um, understanding of your FTE, a good accounting of your FTEs and keep documentation. Um, we know there's a lot of turnover in districts lately. And so we want this data to be easily accessible, especially for next year in FY23. Um, if you have to go back and um, and you're like, well, what was an FY22? How you determined your FTEs especially. And we know there's a lot of questions in the chat. We will 
We'll try to get to them as we can, but we we will use them to create our FAQs as well. Um, like we said, we know we had a lot in the, in this uh, presentation, so we're not as responsive to questions as we normally are, uh, and we are aware of that. So again, this is a, a highlight, our precursor for next year uh, for the FY 2023 um, performance report. We know that this year you only have to say like how many FTEs overall, but next year um, SEUs will need to provide the count of FTE um, assigned to serve each school regardless of funding source. So this year, they just want a general amount of how, how many FTEs you have. Next year, we know that they're gonna want you to identify it by school and also by staff type. So you're gonna have to, like if you have a 0.5 nurse at your elementary school, you're going to have to identify so for all your schools and by each of the categories of FTE or FTE staff type. So this is kind of a precursor for next year. So you can start getting that data ready now, because even though the report will be due in FY24, it's actually going to be for current data right now for FY23. And again, the question was, please provide the count of FTE staff assigned to serve each school in this LEA, regardless of funding source, as of September 30, 2021. This is September 2021. It'll be September um, 2022, actually. And again, um, if you want to see where this comes from, it's page 28 of that public document that Shelly mentioned on the earlier in the presentation. This next slide highlights uh, information that I think all of you know about, unless you're very new to your position. Uh, Monique and I joke that we could probably explain this one in our sleep because it's been a, a requirement all along of the ARP application. And that is that you have two documents publicly available on your website that report how you're using the ARP use of funds. And anytime you revise the ARP application significantly, um, you should also revise the use of funds and upload that again, the, the revision to the website. And also, every six months, you're supposed to, as a school district, review the safe return to in-person instruction plan. And I know it's easy to overlook this because most of us are in, you all are in person now, uh, but still it's a requirement for the length of the ARP um, funds, so for another year and a half or so, that you have a safe return plan and that it be reviewed um, at least every six months, we suggest adding uh, a date to the plan, like last reviewed February 2023, which is what uh, the district um, in my area did. I think it was February. Um, th so then you have to have the URL for us because we have to report the URL. It's publicly available for all the school districts in Maine on our website. And believe me, people check that. And if the website, if the URL doesn't go directly to that document, or at least to a page where it's very, very apparent where the document is, um, it's it's con it's concerning to whoever's looking for the, for it, whether it's the U.S. Department of Education, and they have done some spot checks, and they have asked us to go back and check the, these URLs, uh, and also constituents, people in Maine, uh, taxpayers, uh, legislators, and so forth, have also checked and are concerned when the links don't go directly to the page. So we're going to be asking for you to, once again, um, let us know when the plan was um, reviewed. That's number four, have, have the use of funds plan, have the use of, well, I think it's the return to instruction plan that has to be reviewed, but it, the use of funds plan needs to be updated and current. And we're going to be asking you to provide the use of fund plan right in that um, space. So um, Karen, I could talk about why, if you look at number four, why it says use of funds plan, has this been revised in the last six months? And the reason why that's in there is because um, there are some districts that have reopened their application and made adjustments and revisions to it multiple times. And so it's you want to make sure that if if somebody goes to the publicly available website or the URL on the, and looks for this use of funds plan, it needs to align with whatever 
the approved application is in GEMS. So for example, if you put in here, you say, no, it wasn't revised. And we know that this doesn't, we know it shouldn't be no here. You should have yeses. We This is just taken from our test site. And so we were just trying to get some quick screenshots. Um, but you should have yes, at least for uh, number two and potentially for number four uh, for the use of funds plan if you've made adjustments. And to be honest with you, I'd say the majority of districts have made adjustments to their plans. Uh, but so that, so it will be, it should have a date that said it, that it was um, that it was reviewed. And keep in mind that if you put a date on here and we go and check the the URL that's provided in here, and we also go and check that plan, if we can't if we can't verify that that plan was ver was um, was reviewed on the date that you give, we're probably going to give we're probably going to ask for some more documentation or feedback. Um, as Karen already said, our like I think our number one suggestion is. Whatever plan you have up there, put a date on it, put a date that says when it was reviewed, put a date, say when it was updated, and just keep that, keep that date updated so that it's quick and easy to see if that, when the last time that plan was updated. Um, and I think we have a little screenshot here, a little snapshot here, but that if you, if you go to our website and you click on that little schoolhouse and it says SAU spending and instructional plans, this is, um, this is a, a link to an Excel sheet which lists all of the URLs that were provided by by districts in our last performance report. So if this is not correct, it's because the information that was in last year's performance report was not correct. So it's really important that this URL, the URLs that are provided are accurate because that's what we put in this Excel sheet. And I know Karen already said that, but it's really important. That's why we stress it. Right, 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 right. We've, you know, we've been called off on that, uh, called out on that a number of times already. Um, also, we're asking you, the, the part that's highlighted there is in your application, the very last part is asking for your assurance that you are attesting that if you are using the data, if you are using ESSER funds for minor remodeling, renovation, repair or construction contracts that are over $2,000. I'm reading right from the bullet in the upper left-hand side. If you are doing that, you must meet all of the requirements of the Davis-Bacon Act, which addresses prevailing wage requirements. And there's information about that in the ESSER FAQ B7. Um, we have over on the right-hand column, uh, right-hand column part, uh, the part of the application, I think it's part nine, um, summar summary of the Davis basic banking requirements. And if you check yes, you are literally telling us, we know about those Davis re banking requirements. Yeah, and we're following them. Yes, absolutely. And there should be no audit finding. You know, uh, if, if an auditor is looking at your uh, contracts and checking on this, you've already said yes, that you are following it. And, and we don't expect anyone to say no here because it's a requirement. You absolutely do need to say yes. And you do need to know what the requirements are and you need to follow them. So the reason there's a no here is just because it's a test site. But indeed, if you're using the funds for those purposes and the contract is over $2,000, you must meet the Davis-Bacon uh, requirement. And in our uh, last couple of office hours, we've had some basic information about Davis-Bacon. It's your responsibility as a school district to find out what the requirements are, find out what the language in the contracts are. We do have, as I said, uh, some slides from previous office hours that highlight where you can find from U.S. Department of Labor uh, what the requirements are for, for um, Davis-Bacon. And if you're using legal counsel, they will probably, they should also be able to remind you and make sure that your, your contracts uh, have that requirement in them. So again, we asked the question and I won't, I won't necessarily pause for a response from you, but uh, you could think, think to yourselves about whether or not you would find it an easy job to put your finger on the on the documentation and say, yes, I know we're doing that. I know we have a sign posted in our construction area. I know we have verification of the wages that are being paid to those contractors. Or, you know, no, I better check with whoever the project manager is to make sure that uh, we are following data speaking. So just think about that to yourselves.
So where are we, Monique? I can't even see the slide number on this one. I can do this one. So just lastly, and we know we're, we're running short on time. Um, lastly, just to, this is more of just a how to manage or a navigate through the application system. Um, in GEMS, when you are finished and you're ready to submit, you want to make sure that you have a blue check mark next to each of the sections. That includes directions and um, yeah, a lot of times people like it won't show it and it's because they don't have a check mark next to the directions. You will be on the data entry menu side. And when you have all the check marks there, you will see a little um, paragraph down at the bottom that'll say that, yes, everything's been checked and you're ready to submit. So then you'll go over to, um, you'll go to, from the data entry side over to the mission side, which is just right next to it. And then you will, um, I think Karen, we can see that just, Oh, shoot. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then you're going to, um, let's see, make sure she gets out of that. Sorry. Okay. I, That's okay. Um, and so then uh, you're going to go over to the mission side and you will see a box there to enter your application coordinator password. And you will submit that. And when you submit it, you should get a little red message at the top of the screen saying that you resubmitted it what you, sorry, that you submitted it, not resubmitted. And then when you submit that or the application coordinator submits that, a message will, an email will be sent to the superintendent with the email address, to the email address that it's listed in the application, in the, um, on the cover page. Um, and that superintendent will get that, inf will get um, information or login information to certify the performance report. I think that's it. I apologize for for that. Um, I more often share on Zoom in an Apple environment, and um, it doesn't do that. It doesn't show everything on your computer. I think that's the end of our. Those are the end of. Oh, we have questions. Um, and we're one one thing that I was just eagerly doing was trying to capture all the questions. I had not been uh, following the chat because I was working on the slides, so I took a quick peek at this uh, at the chat and I will say that um yes we will send you know some of the really easy questions we can address pretty quickly we're coming up to the hour but yes we will send the link to register for the um Wednesday office hours and and you know, yes these slides will be we will be posted here are, is our contact information and I'll come off uh I'll stop sharing my screen right now and just kind of look at you all Monique has added that piece. Um, Shelly had to attend to a family uh, situation, not serious emergency, but just a, something that she had no control over. So we're uh, ending the session with you. I, I just want to say one thing about the um, the open hours, the Wednesday open office hours, is that this really is open. We have no we're going to have no agenda um, planned for this. It'll be based on the questions that you bring forth. We do ask that you attempt to go in and work in the performance report before you come with any questions. Um, we don't have any data except to enter for you. So you have all that data, you have all that information except for the populated um, amounts that were spent, that were um, drawn down. Uh, but outside of that, so go in there, try it out and then come to the uh, the open office hours, come with all your questions. And as Shelly said, we will be able to go onto our test site and try to figure out um, and try to work with you to try to figure out, is it an issue that it's a calculation issue or is it um, something we can help you with a misunderstanding or just a concept issue kind of thing. And we know there's a lot of questions in the chat and uh, we will get an FAQ started and get that out to you as quickly as possible. Right. I'm glancing at them now. I mean, thank you for the for folks who interacted with us saying, and there's one literally that says one person said red, green, yellow. And then others of you are asking some uh, technical questions about, you know, preparing for next year. We get that. And again, we will we will address those in an FAQ. What if we haven't drawn down the 20% yet? Yes, that's. that's yeah, a, and the 20% yeah. is actually a really good question because um a priority notice went out today um, that we are going to be uh, on our website start tomorrow. We're going to have an, an ESC, or sorry, an ESSER dashboard, which is going to show how much funding or how much funding has been reimbursed by districts, how much has been spent and reimbursed, not necessarily spent, but how much has been reimbursed 
for uh, ESSER ex um, expenses. And so that might not be as reflective of what you've actually done because it's based on what's been uh, reimbursed. I know there's one question here about if we did not designate flat amounts to schools, would we say no and answer none? No, because you still have to explain how you divvied up the money for next year. Like you're going to have to explain like, how did you decide where to spend the money? Um, and so I think you're gonna have to think about that. Um, there was a plan, there was a way for you to do it. Um, part of this might be also because they want to make sure that these funds went to where they re really needed to go based on the needs that came about because of the loss of instruction or even having to prepare for prevent uh, and respond to COVID-19. So um, I would say there's going to be there will not be a no answer to this. You will need to have some kind of rationale for how funds were um, distributed to schools and how the funds were expended overall. So there's something to think about. And I know there was a question here about salaries and benefits. Um, at this point in time, I'm not. I need to go back and talk about it because uh, I'm not sure exactly how we're how that's going to play out. I know in the in our system we just have it all combined together, but the U.S. Department of Education is requesting that it be separated. But I'm not as actually sure how that's going to translate for us at this point or for the for Maine. So we will get back to you on that question because I don't want to tell you the wrong thing and then have to come back and say have something different. So we will need to go back and check um, if it's okay for um, our schools to do it just combined because that's how we do our system. Um, or are they going to ask you to break or we're going to have to have you break it up. So hold on to that question and we will get back to you on that one. And I think all the other I'm just kind of skimmed through some of the other ones. But we'll definitely um, answer these questions in our FAQ. And I know we're at the two o'clock hours. So we um, we will stay on for a few more minutes, but we thank you guys for listening and all your questions, and we are here to help support you.